What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of the discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, you're living under a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get into another very interesting crime topic. And I'm asked all the time, who are the most interesting people in the history of the America Mafia? And a lot of the time, I will always bring up one name. To me, he is not only a depraved and ruthless killer, but really his life is one of the more interesting stories I've ever heard. I'm also going to tell you why I believe that today's subject is the most ruthless individual in the history of the mob. The story of Tommy Patera. Next on Sit Down Shorts, Thomas Patera was born December 2nd, 1954 in the Brooklyn Italian enclave of Gravesend. If you know anything about Gravesend, it for years has been an area where Italians have dominated the demographics and it's where a lot of mobsters came up. And we'll get into some of the big boys in Gravesend in the story of Tommy Patera. Now, Tommy Patera's father, Joseph, was actually from the Italian province of Salerno. Now, Patera's mother was actually not Italian. She was Polish and German. And Patera, as we know, when you're in the mafia, you have to have your father be Italian. So for Patera, that was good news. Now, Patera's father was actually a very normal man. He was a, a candy salesman. He had a decent job. And he would try to provide for Tommy and his sister, Teresa. Um, though for Tommy Patera, he would take a little bit different tract into criminality than one might think. By middle school, Tommy Patera was an undersized kid. He was pretty small. He had a high-pitched voice, and he was a target of bullies. Um, as we know, you can either be a victim of a bully or you can become a uh, someone that transforms yourself into something that Bullies don't want to mess with. And that's exactly what Tommy Patera would ultimately do. The young Patera quickly would transform himself into a master into the world of karate. He would take up some classes at a dojo in Brooklyn. He would become a natural in the world of martial arts. And it was said that Patera got a lot of his inspiration from some of the old Bruce Lee films uh, back in the day. Patera was a natural at it, and he quickly became a fighting machine. He changed his diet. He began eating uh, a lot of sushi, and he immersed himself in Japanese culture. Patera was particularly proficient in multiple levels of the martial arts. And as I said, he immersed himself in reading and getting to know Japanese culture. Now, at one point, he would attend David Booty Junior High School in Brooklyn. However, Patera would, as I said, become a master at karate and actually win a cash prize as well as a trip to Japan after winning a martial arts competition. He ultimately would head to Japan and spend 27, month, 27 months in that country uh, studying the culture, studying under some of the Japanese martial arts masters, uh, and really becoming a Adonis, if you will. It was said that at one point his family would actually visit him in Japan and they were quite surprised with how much he had changed. He was a mature person who was careful. He was quiet, but he in turn was a fighting machine and he could defend himself now. Now, it's an interesting way where he would ultimately return to Brooklyn and you know, kind of use his ability to hurt people uh, to the advantage of the American Mafia. Upon his return, he would head back to Gravesend and decide that at 22 in 1976, he wanted to become a criminal. He would essentially meet an individual named Anthony Bruno and Delicato. And as we know, Bruno and Delicato was a depraved human being in his own right. He was the son of Bonanno Capo regime, Alphonse Sonny Red and Delicato. Around the time that Patera comes home, from Japan. As we know, the Bonanno family is kind of becoming a mess. Ultimately, Carmine Galanti is killed in 1979. Indelicato's father, alongside two other capos, Philip Lucky Giancone, 
uh, and Dominic Trinchera try to uh, take over the family as Rostelli's in jail. Uh, they kind of go back and forth with Joey Messino. And ultimately, uh, Sonny Red and his son Bruno would become targets. Sonny Red would be killed. Bruno would be um, uh, looked to be killed by uh, the group as well. And he would kind of be out of the picture. The thing for Tommy Batera, though, was by this point, he had become uh, essentially the mentee to Patera. He was now an expert on murder. And the Bonanno family knew if he would get in line and just kind of follow orders, he could be a very accomplished individual. You know, and that's one thing about Patera that we don't talk enough about. Was he a ruthless psychopath? Absolutely. But one thing about being in the mafia, you have to a lot of the time get in line and do what you're told. And Patera knew that in the late 70s, early 80s, things were happening quick in the Bonanno crime family. And he could either be in the line of fire or just get down and be a part of what's going on, taking what's given and slowly rise and becoming a very accomplished person. And that's what he ultimately did. Tommy Patera by the late 70s was also, as I said, getting to know the right people. He was taking advice from people like Bonanno heavyweight Anthony Spiro, who, as we know, I mean, Anthony Spiro, I don't know, gets enough credit really in mafia terms as far as the Bonanno family. Joey Messino, people like that were obviously the big boys in that family, but Spiro was right there as well. Anthony Spiro was the backbone of the Bonanno family in Brooklyn. He was extremely respected in Bensonhurst, in Bath Beach, in Gravesend. And knowing Anthony Spiro was very important to the rise of Thomas Patera. Another person that Patera would become very close to as a bit of a mentee, if you will, was Frank Lino. Now, if you know anything about Frank Lino, he was really the king of Gravesend. He was a, ba a Gravesend legend. Uh, he had come up in the 50s inside a group called the Avenue U Boys. He was a very popular person. And if you know anything about the Lino family, they were very connected, not only in the Bonanno family, but also in the Gambino crime family as well. Eddie Lino, Robert Lino, tons of Linos in the American mafia. And Frank Lino was very powerful in his own right. He would essentially take Tommy Patera under his wing. And he recognized Patera was not only an earner, but he was also a ruthless and depraved killer. And that's exactly what the Bonanno family needed. Patera would make his rise and by 1986 would become a made member of the Bonanno crime family above Joey Messino's business, JNS Cake. Messino would make the young Patera the newest member of the mafia. Patera would instantly slot into the crew of his mentor, Frank Lino. Now, a little bit about uh, Tommy Patera's uh, home life or personal life. One thing we would learn about Patera and any mobster during that time, essentially, they were very quiet people. Patera was a careful guy. He was very reserved. He was very calculated. He didn't talk on the phone. He would constantly be seen with his hand in front of his mouth when he was on walk and talks. He was a careful, calculated human being. And when it came to murder, he was the same way. One thing that I think sets Patera apart, and a lot of people will say, the most ruthless person in the history of the mafia was Roy DeMeo. To me, what made Patera so dangerous is that he did all of the things that he did virtually on his own. Uh, he didn't need a group around him. He took out people with cold calculation and thought nothing of it. He also mastered the art of getting rid of a body, which, you know, back in those days in the 80s, that was pretty much an essential way to get away with the crime. He believed in the old adage of no body, no crime. Now, Patera would live uh, in and around Brooklyn. He would live at 2355 East 12th Street in this walk-up apartment building. Uh, and Patera, at this point, not only was a killer, but he was a very good earner. By this point, he had delved very deep uh, into the drug trade. Uh, he was selling kilos and kilos of cocaine, marijuana, and heroin. And again, I've said this before, if you can be a killer and an earner, you are going to move up in mafia circles. Things are good for Patera. Now, one thing I will say is he also took some of his money and started investing in legit business. He would ultimately buy 
a bar called the Just Us Bar at 126 Avenue S in Brooklyn. Now, today, this building looks a bit different. However, this would be Patera's um, kind of a spot in the 80s and 90s. Now, Patera uh, would be in the crew of Frank Lino, as I said, and he would be very close to another member of that crew, Fat Richie, Richie Artie. Now, Patera would be called on for a lot of hits, one of which makes him kind of uh, a legend in the world of the mafia. Patera would be called upon in August of 1988 on uh, really orders of John Gotti. As we know, John Gotti uh, had a real problem developing in his family. He would find out uh, through a uh, court and things of that nature that one of his closest confidants, Willie Boy Johnson, had been a longtime police informant. Uh, and Gotti wanted him dead through one of his people, Eddie Lino. Lino would contact Patera and ask him to get the job done. They would stalk Willie Boy Johnson to his Brooklyn home and shoot him 10 times. Willie Boy would be found dead at the scene. This was a big time murder for Tommy Patera. He was taking on contracts. He was taking on whatever he could get his hands on. And he continued to move mountains and mountains of narcotics. Now, one thing you will know about the world of narcotics, and one thing Tommy Patera found out very quickly is you have to be ruthless. And there are going to be people that are constantly looking to screw you over in that world. Now, Patera didn't just sell drugs. He was actually ripping and running as well. And he would just do what he had to do to steal your stash. It was well known that Tommy Patera not only, again, was selling drugs, but he was stealing them as well. According to one report, at one point, Tommy Patera would be the leader of a crew that would rob 40 pounds of cocaine from two Colombian drug dealers. At that point, upon the robbery, he would also kill those two individuals uh, and get rid of the bodies. Now, one thing that I want to make very clear in this video, guys, is I would like to get into detail as to what Tommy Patera was doing to these people. Unfortunately, though, due to the ethics of YouTube, I can't actually explain what he actually was doing. Um, I would like to get more into detail, but I just can't do it. I will try to do as best as I can. Uh, it's just unfortunately how YouTube goes. As you know, I like to include details, but some of this stuff is very touchy, and I've known in the past they're not going to let me talk about certain things. Tommy Patera would also kill an individual in the early 90s called Talal Siksik. Now, Siksik was a Middle Eastern drug dealer that at one point screwed Tommy Patera on a drug deal. This is where we would first learn the levels that Tommy Patera would go to hide a body. The truth is he would use a bathtub to get rid of the body. And I don't need to go into detail about Patera and what he was doing, but he was hiding the bodies. He was getting rid of them so they couldn't be found. Now, by this point, and he's many murders in, Tommy Patera would get a bit of a mentee, if you will, of his own. He would begin kind of teaching the tools of the trade to this individual, a man called Frank Ganji. Now, the thing about Ganji that we need to understand is he comes from the Cosa Nostra world as well. He was related to people in the Genovese family. He was from the area that Tommy Patera was, and he understood what the mafia was. Now, there was a difference between Frank Ganji and Tommy Patera. Tommy Patera was a cold individual. He knew murder was part of the game, and he had no problem doing it. He was a professional killer. Frank Ganji was not. And by introducing Frank Ganji into this world, this would come back to bite Tommy Patera badly down the road. And as I said, Patera was particularly efficient at getting rid of the people that he killed, people like Sick Sick, people like the Colombian drug dealers, people that needed to go. Now, in the case of Willie Boy, they wanted that public. But Tommy Patera was getting rid of the bodies and essentially burying them at a wildlife refuge in Staten Island. Again, he viewed it as no body, no crime. He continued to sh flood the streets of Brooklyn with cocaine and other illicit drugs. Now, Patero by this point was maintaining a relationship uh, in the late 80s and early 90s with a woman called Celeste Lapari. Now, Tommy loved Celeste. According to many, she was the only person uh, that only ultimately made Patera happy. 
it was pretty clear that Patera was a very serious person in most aspects of his life. In fact, the only thing that would get him in a way kind of soft or, or, or human like, if you will, was his relationship with Lapari. And he, from many people that knew him, absolutely adored Celeste Lapari. Um, the one problem that Celeste Lapari had was she was a drug addict and she was in and out of rehab. She would be clean for a bit. She would get back into the world, get clean, get back into the world. And Patera had one person that he blamed for this, a woman named Phyllis Birdie. Phyllis Birdie was friends with Celeste Lapari. She ultimately was very close to Frank Ganji as well. And Ganji would detail that he had told um, Birdie to kind of avoid Lapari because, again, the one thing that Tommy Patera loved more than anything was Lapari. And if Birdie was around when something bad happened, it was going to be a real problem for her. Ultimately, Tommy Patera would face the music and Celeste Lapari would overdose and die. Uh, and Tommy Patera had one person in his sights, Phyllis Birdie. Now, Frank Ganji would say that he would allegedly give the advice to Phyllis Birdie and tell her to essentially leave, go away. He's going to be gunning for you. He wants you dead. And Tommy Patera was not going to quit until Phyllis Birdie was killed. It's exactly what happened. He would find her days later and kill her. He would shoot her three times in the head and then get rid of her body. I don't need to go into detail as to how he got rid of her. Just keep in mind it involves sharp tools. I think we can assess what went on there. Tommy Patera was now becoming um, more than just a hitman. He was killing people because he wanted to kill people and he needed to kill people. Now, we can say, now we'll never agree with the decisions of Tommy Patera. Now, think of yourself. Um, Phyllis Birdie essentially introduced Celeste Lapari to the drug world, and she can be blamed a bit for the death of Miss Lapari. In the end, Lapari was, though, an adult and made the decision she made to do drugs. In the cold and twisted world of Tommy Patera, he believed she needed to go for her behavior. By this point, the Drug Enforcement Administration was building a case on Patera. As I said, he continued to shovel kilos and kilos of drugs into the world. And again, they knew he was taking out people to continue to further his drug trade. Now, the Bonanno crime family loved Patera. He was making a lot of money. He was able to do what he had to do to protect his investment. Ultimately, though, for Patera, we would also find out some more sinister things about him. According to Ganji, a killing obviously was very easy to uh, Patera. He would also be known to take valuables off of people he killed and collect them as a weird momentous, if you will. Kind of odd behavior, if we're being honest, uh, very likened to serial killer type behavior. Um, the problem for Patera, though, was the one person that was going to do him in was Frank Ganji. He just wasn't built like Tommy Patera. And we can't blame him. 99.8% of people, if they see a human head sitting on a sink or shower stall, uh, wouldn't be okay with that. And Frank Ganji basically said he couldn't do it. Ganji would ultimately be pulled over for DUI and decided that his conscience uh, had gotten the best of him. Frank Ganji began telling very sickening details about Phyllis Birdie, other folks that Tommy Patera had killed, and basically drew out the entire uh, thing for the DEA. Time was up for Tommy Patera. And as I said, the government had already been slowly building their case on not only he, but other members of the Bonanno crime family. On June 4th, 1990, Thomas Patera would be indicted on 20 counts involving the sale of narcotics and the murders of six people, including Phyllis Birdie, Talal Siksik, Willie Boyd Johnson, and other members of the drug trade. Now, in the search of Patera's apartment uh, in Brooklyn, the federal government would find some pretty odd things. Uh, not only in Patera's home did they find a cache of guns and knives, but they would also find uh, weapons like a samurai sword, 
as well as books detailing not only uh, the drug trade, but how to kill. They would find this book, The Assassin's Handbook by Warren Murphy and Richard Sapir. Now, in this book, um, they would uh, essentially find um, that you could learn how to kill people, uh, all the different torture methods you could use on people. Uh, Patera had a major problem because he killed a lot of people. But Frank Gangy was going to do him in. Now, at court and at trial, Tommy Patera's family would testify, maintaining that Patera was not a killer. In fact, he was a loving and caring family man. He loved his family. That's what they said. Uh, Patera knew, though, the writing was on the wall. And even through the testimony of Frank Gangy, uh, the time was up for Mr. Patera in court and at trial. Chief Prosecutor David Shapiro would talk very openly about the callousness of Tommy Patera. Shapiro would demand the death sentence for Patera, saying, quote, Patera is a heinous and cruel individual. His depraved murders were heartless and ruthless. And he would detail the torture of victims, you know, deliberately shooting them multiple times, you know, carrying out barbaric torture on some of these people, uh, and the methods he would go to keep his uh, killings underneath uh, the rule of law. He would bury them. He would get rid of them. Um, these are the kind of things he was doing. He was burying them very deep in the uh, wildlife refuge so cadaver dogs could not find them. This would all lead to really the end for the Karate King. Now, on June 25th, 1992, Tommy Patera would be convicted of murdering six people and also supervising his drug trade operation in Brooklyn. Now, interestingly enough, he would be acquitted of one murder in this case. Tommy Patera would be acquitted of the 1988 murder of Willie Boy Johnson. The problem, though, was there were other murders that he indeed committed. Now, Tommy Patera at one point during the court case would actually taunt the DEA as the jury deliberated saying to the DEA, quote, I bet you don't, I bet they don't have the balls to kill me, Patera said. And they didn't. Ultimately, the uh, defense for Tommy Patera would prove that multiple murders would actually uh, happen beyond the date of the death penalty being induced. So ultimately for Patera, he would escape the death penalty uh, but he would be convicted on all counts outside of the Willie Boy Johnson hit and be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now, again, parole wouldn't be important because in the federal system, there is no parole. Tommy Patera is still alive and is 68 years old. He sits at one of the most secure prisons in America, USP McCreary in Pine Knot, Kentucky. Now, uh, Patera would still actually maintain a bit of a foothold. According to people that know him, he now is an artist. And look, we can say what we want about Patera and his ruthless inhibitions and abandon, but he actually is a pretty good artist. This is a, a, a picture of a, him uh, that he drew of himself. He also has drawn people like Jimmy Hoffa and Al Capone. Interestingly enough, you can find Tommy Patera's work on Instagram. The handle is at Tommy Karate Patera Artwork, and that is maintained by, I would imagine, someone on the outside. Tommy Patera was a cold and calculated killer. He's a big-time drug dealer, and he made a lot of money for the mafia. In the end, though, as I said, he was a master killer, and he is someone that, for the most part, killed ultimately by himself. He didn't have a group of big-time killers around him. He killed with reckless abandon, had no problem doing what he had to do to get rid of a body and did it for the most part, um, completely independent. And like I said, on his own, Tommy Patera is one of the most vicious people in the history of the mafia, and he will die in federal prison, a just end for his crimes. As always, make sure you hit the like button and make sure you subscribe so you never miss another sit down video.